The views and opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Access for Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at 260-421-1250. Nobody's really happy when they go to the hospital, except when they're having a baby. Nobody's excited about their gallbladder coming out. Nobody's excited about shoulder surgery or knee surgery. But everybody's excited about going and having their baby. To see that miracle within the womb from the earliest ultrasound, follow that mom throughout the pregnancy, and then get to see the joy in the eyes of the mom and the dad when they actually get to see that baby on the outside, knowing that this has been their baby since the moment of conception. It's just that now that baby's on the outside and they get to enjoy that. And that's an absolute thrill. An ultrasound is an amazing tool and the technology has really advanced just in the past 10 years. If you remember an ultrasound back, oh, 10, 15, 20 years ago, if somebody showed you a picture, you could barely even make out where the baby was in relation to that picture. Now we can see the heart beating four weeks after conception actually takes place. We can do three-dimensional ultrasounds where we can actually see facial features of the baby. We can, at an early stage, actually let the mom see whether it's going to be a boy or a girl, see if it's going to be one baby, two babies, three babies, even four babies in our office. So it's an amazing tool, but they can also hear the baby's heartbeat. We can use the ultrasound and we can hear the baby's heartbeat. So we like to see this, the visual of the baby, but we can also hear the baby's heart beating. And we're not just showing somebody a video of somebody else's baby or somebody else's ultrasound. This is their baby. This is their life that's within their wombs. So we offer that counseling for them to say, you know, it's not just a matter of if you think you're ready to be a mom, you are a mom. You know, reproduction has already happened. It's just, are we going to give this baby enough time to be able to survive on the outside? Y'all ever seen that picture of baby Samuel? You know, the kid that they showed the uterus and his hand is coming out and like the physician is holding that. I was speaking up in Atlanta and this kid came up to me after I spoke and he goes, hey, can I have my picture with you? I said, yeah, I'd love to get my picture with you. I said, what's your name? He goes, Samuel Armas. It was little Samuel, the little hand that came out. You know, was he a person when he was there only about 20 weeks gestation? Absolutely. You know, did his mom realize that he was a person there on the inside? Absolutely. When it comes to the pregnancy resource centers, it can have its great days and it can have its sullen days. You have your great days when you have somebody who comes into the office and they were, maybe they were at, in line over at the abortion clinic, or maybe they were counseled here at one of the pregnancy resource centers, and we'll see them in the office and we'll tell about this gift that they have on the inside. And they might have come into our office thinking that there was no other way they had to have the abortion. They were feeling pressure from either family or from their boyfriend, and they really didn't see this baby actually being able to come into the world. But when you show them that life that's within them, and you counsel them, and you give them those options, and you offer them support, then to see them change their mind, and then to say, no, I'm going to keep my baby, which is amazing. But then the truly most exciting part for me is after that baby's born. When you saw a mom that had a baby in the womb, and she was thinking about ending that life, but then she decides to keep that life. And then you'll deliver that baby, you'll see that baby, and it's always at that two-week visit when the mom has had the baby at home for two weeks. She's coming in for her first postpartum visit. And you're sitting there, it's you, it's the mom, it's the baby in the room. And you have to bring up the conversation where you say, do you remember where we were eight or nine months ago? Can you imagine what your life would be now if you had made the decision to end that baby's life now that you see that baby? And every single mom says, I can't believe I even came close to that decision. Where they look at that baby and they say, there's no way I would ever want to not have that baby in my life now that that baby's in their life. At a 
Florida State home football game in 2012 in a packed out stadium. The average attendance in 2012 was 75,000 plus people in a packed out Florida State home football game. Yet in that same year, in 2012, the number of abortions reported here in the state of Florida was 76,000. So we have more babies being aborted here in the state of Florida each year than the number of people that are attending a packed out home Florida State football game. When you look at all of those people that are in a Florida State football game, and if you were to picture some sort of a terrorist act or some catastrophe that would take the lives of all 75,000 of those people in that stadium, it would change our nation, it would change our world. Yet that's the number of the babies that are being aborted here in the state of Florida every single year, year after year. To a physician who is performing abortions, you know, I feel sorry for you. You know, number one, you spent four years in college, four years in medical school, at least four years in residency, trying to develop the knowledge and skill to be able to have healthy moms and healthy babies and to take those lives, all that effort was wasted. You know, I am a 100% firm believer about that there is a heaven, there is a hell. And in Romans it tells us, it starts off and it says, the wages of sin is death. But there's not a period after that punctuation of the wages of sin is death, there's a comma. And then what follows after that, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Is abortion a sin? Yes. Is any sin that we all commit enough to keep us from spending eternity with Jesus? Yes. Have I sinned? Absolutely. Do I deserve heaven? No. The wages of sin is death. I deserve death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So for anybody who is out there and doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, Savior, or anybody who is performing abortions. The Bible also says that one of the things that God hates is hands that shed innocent blood. And I cannot think of any more perfect example of hands that shed innocent blood than the hands that are actually taking lives and performing abortions. Being on the list of things that God hates is a list that I do not want to be on. So I just want to offer to anybody who is performing abortions out there, there is the gift of salvation. You know, can God forgive the abortionist? Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. It's a sin, and, can God, and God can forgive that sin. But God is also a just God. God doesn't expect perfection out of our lives, but He does expect direction out of our lives. So when we recognize, you know, the sin that we've been involved with, and we recognize that gift of salvation, and we come to a knowledge of that saving gift of salvation through Jesus, God expects us to change our direction. He expects a change in our lives because uh, someday we're all going to come face to face with our Lord and we're either going to get that well done, that good and faithful servant or we're going to face the wrath and judgment of a, of a righteous God. And that's a judgment that I do not want to face. Hello, this is Patty Hunter, and this is my show called Patty's Page. Today we are doing a Skype interview with Dr. William Lyle. Just before I came on, we had a seven-minute video of Dr. William Lyle and what he has to say about himself and pro-life. So, Dr. William Lyle is also a board-certified practicing pro-life OBGYN and he hails from Pensacola, Florida. So he's calling all the way from Florida to have a chat with me about pro life and OBGYN. I'll be with you in a second. Catch you later. Well, hello, Dr. Lyle. Your first name is William, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Just call Bill. I'll call you Bill. Oh, my goodness. So, Bill, where are you from? I'm originally from New Jersey, but I've been living in the Pensacola, Florida area for the last 20 years, and I practice obstetrics and gynecology here at Pensacola in Sacred Heart Hospital. What told, why did you choose OBGYN? It's about the only time that somebody's really happy to go to the hospital. I always loved medicine, but I love doing surgery, 
and uh, having a baby is the only time when somebody is happy to be going to the hospital. Nobody's happy about having their hip operated on or having their gallbladder taken out, but everybody's excited about the miracle of life and having a baby, so it's always exciting to have. You're also a doctor. I mean, is there a difference or just... Well, I am a licensed physician. I'm licensed to practice medicine in both Alabama and Florida. All of my practice right now is in the state of Florida. I've also been the department chairman of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Sacred Heart Hospital. I was department chair for two years and vice chair for two years. And for over 10 years, I was an instructor with either the University of Florida Medical School Residency Program or with the Florida State University Medical School Residency Program. But my, you know, even though that's my vocation and my profession, my passion is really uh, educating people about the unborn and helping them understand about the life that's within and discussing the history of abortion here in the United States. I grew up in a pro-life family, but we were not very active at that point as far as the pro-life cause. We just recognized the value of life. It wasn't until my residency in obstetrics and gynecology that I became more involved in knowing what was going on, the numbers of abortions that were being performed. And then in 1999, when I actually finished my residency, it was time to start looking for a job. I'd been in college for four years, medical school for four years, an internship for one year, and then it was residency for four years. So it had oh been 13 years since high school. And the practice that I looked at was a practice here in Pensacola that was uh, held at that point by a gentleman by the name of Dr. Bo Bagenhome. Well, Dr. Bagenhome had been in Pensacola for decades, but, but he also owned the clinic that was the largest provider of abortion services here in our area for... You know, he was an abortionist so, himself. He was an abortionist himself. So what we did was we purchased that practice, and on day one, we stopped not only all abortions, but we also stopped all referrals for abortions. And we had Dr. Bagenholm sign a form called a restrictive covenant or a non-compete, whereby he could not practice medicine in any way, shape, or form in our tri-county area for the next 24 months. This essentially put him into retirement, and he actually completely retired, and he moved back to Sweden, and he has not been back since then. I hope he's not doing abortions over there. They don't need that. I have no idea. I haven't had any contact with him since uh, he left here in the Pensacola area. But uh, it was on a Sunday after church when I went to the office just to go through the office before we actually opened up. And uh, I had never been upstairs where the surgical clinic Mm. was. Mm. And after church, I toured my office and the exam rooms. But for the first time, I went upstairs. And when I went up this narrow hallway of stairs, I couldn't help but realize how many thousands of women over all these decades had walked up that same flight of stairs, had had a surgical procedure done upstairs, and then had let, left out another flight of stairs, no longer with that, that life that was in the womb there with them. And when I got upstairs, there was just this cold, palpable feeling of just sadness. Yeah. And I saw the abortion machine that was there. I saw the instruments of abortion that were still mm-hmm. laid out there on mm-hmm. the uh, on the procedure room table. And it was then that I decided that, well, I've got some skills, and so I'm going to start you know, seeing what I can do. So we did a presentation at our church. We showed ultrasound images of the life within the womb, and we showed how we treat the babies as patients on the inside. But then we also went through and we said, this is how a first trimester abortion is done. This is how a second trimester abortion is done. This is how a partial birth abortion is done. And we've had such a strong response from around the country that it's really turned into a ministry for me. I was recently out in Colorado Springs, Colorado, recording a couple of radio shows with Dr. James Dobson, the focus on the family. Um, I'm a medical advisor with Priest for Life out of Washington, with Father Frank Frank, Frank Pavone. So uh, I enjoy doing what I'm doing, and it's always an honor to be able to be able to speak with anybody about a, an issue that I feel very passionate about. Yeah, my aunt was a, my late aunt, aunt was an abortionist, and I really was the only one in the family that was against the whole thing. And after watching uh, the 13 minute uh, video of of your, uh, what do you call it? God's miracle of life? God's miracle of life? Yes. 
I was very angry in, inside because my aunt had done that. And I couldn't believe that. I, it's the first time I ever seen anything, you know, like, you know, it came like a shock in a way, you know, what my aunt had done. I forgive her, but it took me a while. Uh, it took me 30 to 40 years for me to forgive her. Because yeah, I was so angry. Is, is that forgiveness is available from God if we accept yes. the truth and the gift of salvation available only through the blood of Jesus Christ, then we can have that eternal forgiveness. It's one thing if family members or colleagues forgive us here on earth, yeah. but that doesn't give us any bearing in eternity. But God doesn't expect perfection in our lives, but he does expect a change in direction in our lives. And uh, But unless we come to that humbling experience where we recognize that what we were participating in was sin and we ask God for forgiveness through Jesus, then we just face that eternal you know, uh, time in hell, which nobody would want to experience, which is no. why Christ okay. came to die for all of us, not just for a few, but he came for whosoever. And that gift of salvation is available to everybody. Yeah, that uh, 60 minutes of God's miracle of life, can that be shown in churches as well as... Sure. Yeah? You know, there's the version that's actually up on YouTube. I'm always happy if people want to make a recording of that or even just broadcast it live, whether it's in a youth group. That's actually a condensed version of the entire DVD, which is about 60 minutes. We actually recorded the original DVD in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, in front oh, yeah. of a Catholic school class. Oh. And it would, there's a question and answer period where we... We're there to educate the students as far as what the miracle of life is, how advanced the development is of the baby so early to discuss abortion honestly and then to spend some time and answer their questions. And we still do talks around the country to junior high and high schoolers, not only talking about the miracle of life and abortion, but also we do a lot of different talks as far as sexual purity where we discuss God's plan for sexual purity yeah. and we give them the honest information that follow God's rules and your partner follows God's rules, you don't have to worry about the consequences of sexually transmitted diseases. So we want them to know what the potential consequences are. We want them to know the physical consequences, the psychological consequences, the spiritual consequences, but also let them know that God has a perfect plan for them, but that there, when we deviate from God's plan, that there can be consequences. We want the kids to understand what the honest potential consequences are from deviating from God's plan. Do you just go to uh, schools that are religious, or do you no. go to... I mean, sexually transmitted diseases don't just affect the kids in the religious schools. I mean, we give honest talks about sexually transmitted diseases and how condoms are not something that makes it impossible to get exposed to a sexually transmitted disease. There are a lot of sexually transmitted diseases, such as herpes simplex, which is spread by skin-to-skin -skin contact. And there right. is a lot of skin that is not protected by something like a latex condom. Right. And we let them know that condoms are not the absolute as far as preventing pregnancy, but they can have a failure rate of between 10 and even up to 20% if they aren't used properly. But that lots of tra sexually transmitted diseases can still be transmitted even if somebody is properly using a condom. And these aren't often things that we can just give you an antibiotic and treat it and make it go away forever. Something like herpes can come back years and years and years on a regular basis. Would that do damage within the body? Sure. Um, any of the sexually transmitted diseases can cause damage. Um, whether it's gonorrhea and chlamydia, which can cause damage on the inside, especially to the patient's uh, fallopian tubes, it can affect fertility in the future. Um, herpes not only can affect the patient, but herpes can actually affect a future pregnancy and the baby that's on the inside. If somebody is, say, 39 weeks pregnant and they are in active labor and they have an outbreak of herpes, the recommendation is not to allow them to have a vaginal delivery, but to proceed with a C-section to prevent the virus from affecting the babies. Um, the virus can infect the baby's brains. Their brains can get infected with a condition called herpetic encephalitis. Uh, even though we have antiviral treatments, this still has the potential to be a lethal infection to the baby. Mm -hmm. But the infection not only can cause pain uh, to the moms, but it can actually cause pain to the baby that might not be born for years and years after the patient has been exposed to the virus. Oh, wow. 
Um, when you say that you had stopped the abortions from day one when you finally got your practicing uh, clinic, uh, what happens to the women who are pregnant and they want abortions? How did you approach them? Or did they come to you? We just told them very honestly. We said we no longer provide those services here at this office and uh, we no longer will refer you to a location, but we'd love to have you come in. And we wouldn't even charge them for the first ultrasound. We would say, hey, we'd love to have you come in and let's see what's going on. I'd love to show you the life that's there within your womb. We'll do an ultrasound here in the office. I'll let you see exactly what's going on. And then you can make the decisions that you want to know. But I want you to know that a pregnancy is a lot more than just four drops of urine on a little pregnancy test that comes back with a little positive line. Here, that right. yeah. from the time an egg and a sperm get together, those cells are unique from the mother, they're unique from the father, yes. and this is a new life. And even as early as 20, 22 days after conception, we can actually see and hear the baby's heart beating there on the inside. And so we would offer them free ultrasounds just so they could see the life. And a lot of those moms would see that life there on the inside, and they would say, oh my gosh, I didn't know there was so much going on. And they would change their mind, and they no longer were abortion-minded, but they actually became pregnancy patients of ours, and we would carry them follow them throughout their pregnancy. Um, unfortunately, you, still others would choose to seek uh, out a termination of that pregnancy somewhere else, either in the county or in the state. And, uh, you know, our job is to be faithful. Our job, we felt very confident, was to let them know what the life was within the womb, let them know that there was a, a baby there on the inside, to let them know the blessing that they had of having that baby on the inside, and to answer all the questions that they would have. But uh, we just wanted to let them know about that life. So when the people um, are shown, mothers are shown that there is really a baby inside and they get really confused. Do you, do you, do you send them to crisis pregnancy centers or you just well, do it yourself? Well, or? We have three pregnancy centers that we have in our town, two in Pensacola and one over in a neighboring town called Milton. It's usually the centers that will send the patients over to oh, us. To you. Oh, to okay. They yeah. usually will seek out the center first. We also have a group of folks who are very active with 40 Days for Life that yes. every Friday are at one of our local abortion clinics. And while they're doing their sidewalk counseling, if they have a young lady who is pregnant and is considering an abortion but would like to have an ultrasound, Often they'll just give us a call and say, can we bring this young lady over? We'll do an ultrasound right then and there and let them see the life within. An ultrasound can be a very effective tool. It lets them know what's going on on the inside. In fact, one of our ultrasound clinics actually, one of our pregnancy clinics actually has an ultrasound machine in their office, but it's not always perfect. You know, we'll, I'll still even after people will see the baby on the inside, they'll hear the heartbeat, they'll see the baby moving around on the inside. You know, too many times they'll still decide they want to terminate that pregnancy and get the abortion. We just want to be available to them and let them you know, know that we're there, that the ladies and gentlemen from the Pregnancy Resource Center have lots of resources to help them through this. There's counseling available, but there's also sharing of the gospel that's available to them. Yes. Where they want them, let them know, hey, you know, not only is your you know, baby something that you know, deserves your love, but that there's, there's a God that loves you and sent his son for you for you to have that gift of salvation. So it's an opportunity to share the gospel, but also to honestly counsel them because we know about the consequences of abortion. We know about the regrets that so many women have and how too often they didn't really appreciate yeah. it. Nobody had told them about that life within the womb. And they didn't, they didn't, there's no closure because they know that they're the ones that killed their own babies. Yeah, and is forgiveness available? Yes. It of course is, there's indeed. Forgiveness, but there is still that pain of knowing that you had a baby there within your womb. And I can't tell you how many patients I've had who might have been young, might have been unmarried, who were pregnant, and uh, despite counseling, still decided to abort that pregnancy. And then years later, when they think they're ready for a baby, all of a sudden they're having challenges getting pregnant. They might have problems ovulating. They might have problems with uh, the egg and the sperm getting together. They're seen in fertility doctors. And it's real sad when you have a mom who says, I didn't have any idea that that could potentially be my only opportunity to have a baby and now we're going through infertility if I had known that that might be my only pregnancy I, I sure wouldn't have ended that pregnancy and, and that can be tough 
but we want to treat them with love, treat them with respect, treat them with all the modern technology that we have, and let them know that, yes, it was wrong, and yes, there are consequences, but there's forgiveness, and we do our best to work with them, to work towards another pregnancy for them. Tubular pregnancy. That's a good question. What can you do? It's when it, when it, you have an ectopic pregnancy? Yeah. You know, unfortunately, our technology is not to the point where we can take a pregnancy from the tube and place it someplace else in the body where it would be able to grow. At this point, when a pregnancy does occur in the tube, it has it, it immediately starts to send out trophoblasts and establish a blood supply. And to move that pregnancy from that area completely disrupts that blood supply, and we can't just move that pregnancy into the womb where we could. Um, there are a couple of ways that we can treat the pregnancy that's there on the inside, but we have to realize that if we don't treat an ectopic pregnancy, we could not only lose definitely the baby, but we could potentially lose the mother's life as well. Okay. So it's, it's a rough situation, but in order to save at least one of those lives, often we'll have to perform a surgery to remove either that tube or the pregnancy that is within the tube in order to save the life of the mother. That's the only time that abortion should ever be. Yeah, and that's not even a pregnancy that has ever made it to the womb. I mean, there yeah. are times with a pregnancy within the womb where we need to deliver the baby early. There yeah. are conditions such as severe preeclampsia, they used to call it toxemia, or even eclampsia where a mom is having a seizure, where yeah. the only cure is to deliver the baby. But taking the life of the baby does not help the mother out at all. No. Um, we deliver okay. the baby sometimes early in order to protect the health of the mother, but we have the intensive care nursery there available. We do everything we can to preserve and save the life of the baby. Margaret Sanger. Yes. She's the one. She was She's a sympathizer. She was one of the sympathizers. Sip my mother. No, my sympathizer that uh, agreed with Hitler, right? Correct. Yeah, and, and as a, one of the founders of Planned Parenthood, one of the things that Margaret Sanger is most notorious for was how she saw this as a way of decreasing the population of the African American race here in the United States and to control them. And she really saw the African American population as a scourge on the United States and really as pests and that the availability of abortion services would allow for the control of that population and uh, you know her racial hatred is pretty well established in her thought process and yet so many people will still hold her up as a hero even though of course half of all the babies that she did abort were female and uh, one of the targets that you'll see even to Planned Parenthood today is having these clinics, which majority of their services are abortion services, having these clinics set up in primarily African-American communities. That is so not right. That is so not right. I agree. I mean, abortion goes back thousands of years, but we got to put a stop to it somehow. we got to educate the people, you know? I, I agree, and that's one of the things that myself and a lot of other groups try to do is let people know. We've all seen the videos that have come out recently from the uh, Center for Medical yeah. Progress, right. which have been, been exposing the barbarism within Planned Parenthood, and it's great to expose that barbarism, but yet you know, we still have our leadership that even though we provide over $540 million worth of financial services directly to Planned Parenthood, not only should we be looking at uh, defunding Planned Parenthood, there are people in Planned Parenthood that we really need to be investigating, even considering uh, arresting people that are involved in Planned Parenthood, just because, and that's just with the violation of laws that are on the books. Not the, you know, I would say that the taking of any innocent life on the inside is should be considered a crime. Yes. But even current law that states you cannot sell uh, organs of babies and that is, is illegal as it states is something that Planned Parenthood has been very active in. So the videos that were heroically recorded 
by the Center for Medical Progress have really done a lot to expose Planned Parenthood for who they really are and for the uh, way that they really treat babies as commodities and how they really are not only harvesters, but they're the purveyors and sellers of organs from baby humans. I, I can't believe that our human race would be more, I mean, worse than animals on this planet. Yeah, it, it, I, you know, I've taught several weeks. I've had a real burden for the study of, uh, of Israel and its history and yeah. for the Jewish people. Often mm -hmm. we'll attend a Messianic synagogue that's located here within our town. About a year and a half ago, we had the opportunity to go over to Israel. One of the groups that I spoke with was a group called Efrat. What I didn't realize was that when abortion was legalized in Israel in the oh. late 1970s, that if you take the numbers of legal abortions that have been performed in Israel, that in 2013, the year that we were there, the number of legal abortions that have been performed in the state of Israel equaled the number of Jews under the age of 18 that were either killed or died during, during the entire Holocaust. So you had the Holocaust, which occurred over in Germany, and now you've had the second Holocaust, which has, has occurred right within the walls of Germany. I mean, right within the walls of Israel. The other thing is that the people who lived near the concentration camps, the people that worked in the concentration camps, were very aware of what, were, what was going on inside. They would see the ashes from the from the incinerators floating up into the air, landing on their cars, brushing the ashes off, and they were very well aware that these were the ashes of Jews that had been taken there by the tens of thousands in these train cars. Yet they just ignored it, and it just was part of their day. The people that worked there really got desensitized, yeah. and they stopped seeing the barbarism of what was really being done. The same way that a lot of people might live close to an abortion clinic, a lot of people even work in an abortion clinic, or might be involved in medical research with the harvesting of these organs, where after a while, it just becomes part of the job. Yeah. And Generation. that sense of, yeah. of what is considered evil. Generations of children yes. growing up. And the majority of the kids do not. If you grew up in an era where abortion was always legal for all of your life, you assumed that it was always legal. Yeah. I was born in 65, so I was 8 years old when Roe versus Wade came through. So I only remember a time when abortion was not the legal law of the land in the United States. And we look at the kids that are growing up in high school and college just now, they can't even imagine what it was like and that, you know, we had a nation where, you know, the abortion on demand was not legal here in the United States. They don't but I also see knowledge. a lot of hope in the younger kids because the younger kids are a very visual generation. They learn by watching videos. They spend their time watching videos, searching YouTube, looking at things on Skype, and they're visual learners. And they look at the videos like I put up and other groups put up, and they can see how treat the unborn as patients. They can see that development. You can't fool them and say it's just a blob of tissue on the inside because they can see the video of the baby's heart beating on the inside. And when you when I travel around speaking for Students for Life and other groups that are on campuses, whether it's high schools or colleges, I get great hope by seeing the fact that these kids are aware, they're intelligent, and they're expressing themselves. They're able to communicate through social media and let people know what the truth is about the life within the you know, that is a good uh, thing to uh, lead into to that 13-minute uh, video that you had yes. taken from the 60-minute uh, God, God's Miracle of Life. So we're yes. going to show that now, okay. and we'll be right back with you. Great. Hold on. Well, my name is Bill Lyle. I practice obstetrics and gynecology in Pensacola, Florida, and board certified and obstetrics and gynecology. And we're here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida at St. Thomas Aquinas Catholic High School. And we're going to be doing a presentation I call God's Miracle of Life. Um, I came to the realization that the abortions that are being performed here in the United States are primarily being performed by my peers, by other people who have spent their lives, you know, learning about obstetrics and gynecology with the goal of trying to have healthy moms and healthy babies and realize that they're has to be something that we can do to educate people to let them know about the amazing development of the babies on the inside. We're also going to talk about abortion. We're going to talk about the numbers of abortions that are performed. And we're also going to talk about the different techniques that are going to be performed and how abortions are done. 
and I just appreciate the opportunity to let y'all know the truth because we really realize that if people really understand the truth, we wouldn't have the 1.3 million abortions performed in this country every year. Abortions are done in our county and state and in the country. So now we're going to go through the first and second and third trimester abortions and give you good ideas on what's actually going on. When you hear an abortion is done or you hear a partial birth abortion, I want you guys to have a real good idea in your mind. It's like, well, that's what that was. Okay, now I understand. First trimester abortion. The mental image, try to picture my daughter, you know, there on the inside in the ultrasound when she was kind of jumping and sliding, jumping and sliding. That would be at the end of the first trimester. This is a speculum. Okay, first thing the doctor would do is he'd have the mom up where this chair would be, okay, and the surgeon would be sitting here, you know, in a chair across from her, and her legs would be up this way. The surgeon would take the speculum, which is going to go into the mom's vagina, to give them a view of the cervix. The cervix is the lowest part of the womb for the uterus. When you hear, like, when somebody's in labor, and they say her cervix is five centimeters, her cervix is eight centimeters, that's what's opening up. The cervix is what's opening up before the mom can actually have the baby. But the job of the cervix is to keep the baby inside until she gets to her due date, until she gets to be termed. So what the surgeon has to do and the abortionist has to do is to actually go in and forcibly open up the cervix in order to get the baby out. That's his only goal. His goal is to kill the baby and get the baby outside of the uterus. So the first thing is the speculum is placed in the vagina, all right, and it's opened up. And when it's opened up, the doctor can then see inside and can see the cervix, the lowest part of the womb. The doctor would then take something like this, and this is called a single tooth tenaculum. Tenaculum is then sometimes placed on the inside and it grabs the cervix. You can see how that would grab and would not let go. That's a tenaculum. So that way he has a hold of the cervix and he has a hold of the womb, and now he can start to open up the cervix. Okay, so I'm going to set this down. Well, the cervix is closed. I mean, it's closed tight, like it's my, it, like my fist right there. So they have to open up the cervix in order to get up to where the baby is. So they do that by forcing small, small pieces of metal called a dilator. This is a small one. This is called a dilator. And the tip of this is placed into the cervix, and then it opens it up a little bit. Well, these instruments can go up and get a lot bigger, depending on the size of the baby, so that you can forcibly open up the cervix in order to get the baby to come on down. So the first trimester abortion, they'll dilate the cervix, and then after they've opened up the cervix, essentially the door to get up into the, the womb, they'll take an instrument like this. This is called a suction curette. A suction curette is attached to a hose, a little tube, that goes to a suction machine, which has you know a large vacuum pump in there to suck out whatever is up on the inside. During the first trimester, this machine is so strong that it can actually suck out the baby with as developed as you saw my daughter jumping up on the inside. And her muscles are there, her bones are there, everything is already there, and it can suck it through this tube. So this tube with, is then, this curette is placed up inside the womb, the suction machine is turned on, and the baby with all of its arms and legs and heartbeat is then brought out in pieces you know, through that suction tube and ends up over in the suction machine. So years ago, when they would show babies after they'd had an abortion, they'd say, look, it's just a blob of tissue. This wasn't a baby. You know, of course it doesn't look like a baby because you've just torn it apart. It's kind of like, you know, looking at a lump of hamburger and say, there's no way that was ever a cow, you know, because it just doesn't look like it. When you put a baby through a machine that's that strong, it's not going to look like a baby anymore. But that's how the vast majority of abortions are performed with the suction machine, okay, and brought out through that small little tube. Now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the second trimester abortion. Remember the uh, baby that was getting the surgery? All right, remember they are doing the surgery on the baby's back? Well, when the baby is that far along, there's no way you can 
bring the baby down through a tube like this. You couldn't even, you would even have trouble bringing a baby down through a tube that big, okay? So since you can't bring it out through a tube, then you have to use something like this. And this is a forcep that has teeth here on the inside. The teeth are kind of like shark's teeth. They all angle back. So if I put this on my finger and I pull backwards, it just grabs you know, stronger into my finger because they don't want to you know, lose a grip on what's up there on the inside. So we're not going to show any baby parts, we're not going to show you any blood, but you're going to know exactly what's going on. The babies that are up on the inside, just like we saw them operating on that baby and fixing the defect in the baby's spine, babies up in the womb. They use an ultrasound machine. They use the speculum. They dilate the cervix as large as they can get it. And then they'll use the ultrasound machine and take this instrument and they'll guide this up inside where the baby is, up in the womb. They'll open it up and while watching the video on the ultrasound, they might grab an arm. And since they can't pull the whole baby down, they'll grab an arm and then they'll rip the arm off while the baby's still alive. And they'll take that arm and they set the arm aside. Then they'll reach back up and they'll grab an arm, maybe a leg, but they just keep reaching and grabbing until they've brought all the baby parts down. The abdomen, the chest, the lungs, the ribs. The last thing that's usually up inside is usually the baby's head, the baby's skull, because that's usually the hardest thing. And it's large enough that a lot of times they have difficulty just bringing it down because it's, you know, a round circle. It's just a little bit too big. So they'll actually grab it with this instrument. They'll be able to see it on the ultrasound. They'll grab it and then actually crush it to make it small enough so they can bring it on down. So when you picture, you know, the babies that were getting surgery done, and you see how well developed they were. I mean, to dismember a baby like this, this is what a second trimester abortion is, okay? And sometimes people will say, well, do the babies feel pain? Absolutely. You know, when we're doing a test called an amniocentesis, where we're putting a needle inside around the fluid around the baby to get some fluid out to do special tests, sometimes when the babies are moving around, they'll bump up against that needle. And as soon as the babies bump up against that needle, you know, their heartbeat goes up, they'll like, you know, jump back, they'll, you know, they'll say, I don't know what's going on over there, but I don't want to be anywhere near that side of the womb, okay? So they do feel pain. If they can react with just a tiny needle, you can imagine how these babies will react when they're having an arm or a leg just taken off. But that's how a second trimester abortion is performed. The next thing we're going to talk about is what's called a partial birth abortion. If we can't get the nation and our legislature to understand what's really going on here, we're never going to have any kind of an impact. Partial birth abortion can be performed at any gestational age, okay? You know, we talked about Roe versus Wade and all the things that came into that. You know, there are so many things that, when you think, you know, you can do this procedure if mom's health is in jeopardy, you think, well, you know, I guess if we don't, if we don't do this, mom dies, that means her health. Health is defined as physical, emotional, psychological, age, familial, so just not anything too young, too old, anxious, depressed, any of these things can be considered health and have these procedures to be performed. But with a partial birth abortion, the baby is there up on the inside and the baby is alive. All right? They will then use an instrument, they dilate the cervix, sometimes it takes a couple of days to open up the cervix enough in order to lower the baby. And this can be done at any gestational age. But what's done is then the baby's foot is grabbed up from the inside and it's brought back down, all right? So we're essentially delivering this baby breech, all right? And when the first foot is brought down, the baby is still alive, they then reach up and they'll deliver the second foot and the second leg. And now they have a good grip on the baby and baby's alive, the baby's you know, moving around. Then they'll put a little bit of traction on, they'll start to bring the baby down a little bit more. And as they're bringing the baby down more, the arms start to come into view and they'll reach up with one finger they'll grab the right arm they'll sweep it down and they'll deliver the right arm then they'll rotate the baby around and they'll deliver the left arm now at this point 90 percent of the baby is on the outside you know the baby has already completely left the womb and is beyond the cervix and it's just the baby's head that's sitting there still in the vagina legally the baby is not born yet all right the baby hasn't taken its first breath the baby's alive moving, doing its thing while it's being held in the, in the doctor's hand. And I use the term doctor really loosely. But the baby's being held right there. But what they need to do now is they need to, you know, you know, do the abortion procedure. They need to kill the baby. And the way they do that, it's one of the more common ways, is they'll use a pair of scissors like this. Now, you remember from your biology class, remember the foramen magnum, that hole in the base of the skull where your spinal cord comes down from the brain into the back and into the spine? 
This scissor is then placed at the base of the baby's neck, at the base of the skull, and is forced up into the baby's skull, into the baby's brain cavity. And then the scissor, you know, is opened up just like that to expose that area. If this doesn't kill the baby just by doing that, then the thing they can do is they can then take a suction curette, place it up into the hole they just made, up into the baby's brain, and then turn the suction machine on. Just like it crushes a steel can, you can imagine what it does to the baby's brain up there on the inside. Once they've done that and they've killed the baby, which now, of course, stops moving, then they'll deliver the rest of the baby, you know, dead. But that's when you hear partial birth abortion. You know, there's no way that that part of the procedure, when you, yes, there are some reasons where we need to deliver babies early. When moms are sick, and the only way we're gonna get mom better is by delivering the babies early. But to deliver the legs, the belly, the chest, and both arms of this baby, and then kill the baby at that point, how does killing the baby at that last second protect the mom at all? It doesn't, you know? It's just a way of being able to justify in somebody's head killing babies at any gestational age, whether it's the first trimester, the second trimester, or the third trimester. But that's what a partial birth abortion is when it comes up in the news and it comes up, you know, in the legislature. That's what's really going on. Just picture that. I mean, babies that would do just fine. We have babies that do well at 23, 24, 25 weeks at our intensive care nursery, and we have great survivals. I mean, these are babies that are even further along than that, that all they need is just let the head come out, clamp the cord, cut the cord, let the baby go to the nursery, okay? Those are first, second, and third trimester abortions. If you look over on the far right side, you can see the cap of that steel can. And there's a small little tube coming out. Well, that's that little suction curette that we were demonstrating with. Well, I've taken that suction curette and I've attached it to the hose that goes to the suction machine. And even though I can't crush that, that can, I can't even stand on it and crush it, when you just turn on the suction machine with just the suction force alone, that's what it does to the can. So you get an idea, it's like, well, if you can do that to a steel can, you can just imagine what that's doing for the first trimester baby there on the inside, and also what it's doing for the baby's brain there in the partial birth abortion in the third trimester abortion. Well, that was a very, very sad and heavy and somber video that we just watched. Um, tell me more it's, about it, why you put it together. What uh, we try to do is to educate people as far as the life within the womb. We want them to know that a pregnancy is a lot more than just a positive pregnancy test. We want them to know that the baby has a heartbeat, that the baby is moving around inside, and then we demonstrate how abortions are performed in both the first, second, and third trimester. We educate people the way that we treat patients as not only uh, them being the patient, but the baby on the inside as being our patient as well. One of the first blood tests that we'll perform when a pregnant patient shows up is what's called an antibody screen. Because antibodies can be in the mother's blood, can cross the placenta over to the baby, and can actually attack the baby's blood. Oh. Well, why would the mother's blood attack the baby's blood? Well, that's because half of the antigens in the baby are from the mother, and the other half of the antigens are from the father. Those antigens from the father can be seen as the, by the mother's body and the mother's immune system as foreign, and the baby can be attacked by those antibodies. When we see a positive antibody screen, we want to see, well, how is this attacking the baby, and is the baby okay? It used to be that we would have to do an amniocentesis where we would actually take a needle and put it into the fluid around the baby so that we could see if the baby was ill. Yeah. Now, with some of our modern ultrasounds, if we want to see if the baby's blood count is low, we can actually use the ultrasound and we can look at a tiny little artery in the baby's brain called the middle cerebral artery, and we can measure the speed of individual blood cells going through the middle cerebral artery, and we can with pretty good accuracy predict that the baby's blood count is low. 
if we think the baby's blood count is low and we don't do anything about it, the baby can die there in the womb because it'll go into heart failure from this loss of blood there within the inside. So we'll schedule the mom and the baby to come into the hospital for a blood transfusion. Not a blood transfusion going to the mom, but a blood transfusion going specifically to the baby. Yeah. Because the mother's blood and the baby's blood do not mix. The baby often will have a completely different blood type from that of the mother. Because the baby is its own life. It's its own person from the moment of conception. The baby is not part of mom. The mom is different from the baby. Yes. Well, if we determine that the baby needs to have a blood transfusion, we will take a tiny little needle and we'll guide it with ultrasound through the mother's abdomen, through the wall of the uterus, into the amniotic fluid around the baby, and we'll actually guide the tip of the needle right into the vein of the umbilical cord. Oh, we'll oh. sample a small amount of blood back immediately, and we'll run that for a blood test where we can calculate how much blood the baby requires. And then through that same needle, we would give blood that somebody had donated to our local blood center. We want O negative, CMV negative blood, and we'll give the baby a blood transfusion. We can do this as early as 18 weeks gestation. This is less than halfway through the pregnancy. Mm. This is seven weeks before a baby could even be expected to survive on the outside. Mm. We do the blood transfusion, but that doesn't fix the whole problem because the antibodies will still be attacking the baby's blood. Sometimes we have to give these babies a blood transfusion every three to four weeks for the rest of the pregnancy. But we are treating the babies as patients. There's another condition called a bladder outlet obstruction, oh, where yeah. we look at the baby and we say, you know, there is just not enough fluid around the baby. Why is there not enough fluid? And we'll look and we'll see the baby has kidneys. The baby should be producing urine, but the baby's urine cannot get out of the bladder. So we would have one of our specialists place a tiny little drain in the baby's bladder because if we don't let the urine come to the outside, then the baby's kidneys will fail. And when the baby is born, the baby will pass away days or weeks later from kidney failure. But if we put a drain in the bladder early on, the, bladder, the urine can drain from the bladder and then the baby is born at term. The obstruction is then corrected by a pediatric urologist and the baby lives a long, happy life. If we didn't intervene, the baby would either die on the inside or die shortly after. And so we know, treat the babies as patients. Yes. You know, mom's a patient, baby is a patient. We teach They're our residents separate. two rules on labor and delivery. One, we want healthy moms and healthy babies. Babies are separate. We yes. have to let them know that they're individuals. They're not saying a piece of property of the mother. They Correct. are the, the mother is a life support system for the baby. I like to spear fish and go scuba diving. When I am down at the bottom of the ocean, you know, my oxygen tank and my dive tank and all my dive gear is my life support system. Right. The mother is the life support system for the baby. But the baby has its own blood supply, it has a different blood type. The baby gets rid of things that the baby doesn't need by crossing it over to the mom through the placenta. And all the things such as glucose and proteins and sugars and water and oxygen that the baby does need come across the placenta to the baby. But the baby's blood and the mom's blood do not mix together because they, these are two different individuals. And they have their own separate souls. They do, from the moment of conception. That's right. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming on to my show. Uh, oh, it's been an honor. I really appreciate the opportunity. If you all have any questions, you know, my website, which we're actually redoing completely now, but the website name will be the same, is prolifedoc.org. P-R-O-L-I-F-E-D-O-C dot org. O -R -G. Yes, ma'am. Just prolifedoc. And, uh, but it can be either dot org or dot com. There's videos that are posted there. And there's other information. Um, a lot of the things that I enjoy doing are speaking at pregnancy resource centers. Uh, next month, I'll be speaking at an annual banquet at a pregnancy resource center October 22nd oh, yeah. in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And two days later, I'll be over in uh, uh, Palm Coast, Florida. I'll also be over at a pregnancy resource center coming up in uh, Austin, Texas. Wow. And I'll be up at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University speaking there as well. So Wow, you get around. So to speak. <laughs> Do you ever come to Fort Wayne, Indiana? Would you? I have been to Fort Wayne, Indiana before. In fact, uh, you, you probably...
probably know who Diamond and Paranite and Essex Copper when I was in, in graduate school. I actually worked at, you know, for Diamond, Essex, and Paranite selling copper wire. So I know oh, Fort Wayne. Stars. Oh, my goodness. Well, you know, Dr. William Lyle, um, that, what language is that, out of curiosity? Is that English or? Uh, my particular spelling of Lyle, L-I-L-E, is actually French. It's actually ah. from a city called Lille, which is right on the Belgian border, which I'll actually be visiting in December for the first time. So the L-Y-L-E would typically be English, and the L-I-L-E used to be L. I L L E, but it's French. Ah, oui, merci beaucoup. Eh? Yes, je parle un peu de français. Un petit peu français, eh? So, okay. au revoir, monsieur. Au Thank revoir, you, Bill. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Godspeed, my love, until we meet again. You're always in my heart and every dream. Don't let time apart give in to all our fears God will keep us close from up above so until we meet again God speaks